I really want to thank you uh, for taking time out of um, your busy day to have a chat with me. Um, but before we go on to uh, some of the really pertinent questions that are being asked by our members and concerns that they have, um, do you want to just tell us a bit about yourself and, and the work that you do for uh, Police Care UK? Sure. Um, so my role at Police Care UK is I'm um, Director of Research. So basically, um, I look after how we understand um, as a charity what the needs are um, of uh, the police force and staff across the UK. Um, and that's in terms mainly predominantly in terms of psychological well-being and resilience. Um, personally, I focus on trauma. Um, I'm a neuropsychologist um, and I also work um, part of the time for the University of Cambridge um, looking at trends in um, PTSD and working conditions within the police. Um, I've not always been an academic. I worked um, with Cambridgeshire Police uh, and Thames Valley Police for some time, um, working on critical incidents um, stuff and um, emergency planning, civil protection, preventing violent extremism. So I've had kind of sort of a periphery understanding of some of the operational factors around policing. Um, but there's still a lot that I learn about how it actually is to be a police officer on the ground. And that's why it's really, really important that I can reach out and talk to people and listen um, before we start to advise to make sure that we actually really, truly understand um, what it is that officers and staff need to stay resilient. And then I can hopefully bring in a bit of understanding about how the brain works to help make that happen. Perfect. And uh, obviously, um, there was quite a bit of publicity uh, last year in relation to the work that you did with Cambridge University and Police Care um, yeah. on the, the life survey. Uh, do you want to just yeah. give a bit of an update from uh, some of the key results uh, that, that came out of that survey? Because that was really relevant to policing. Sure. Um, I suppose the overwhelming um, reality that trauma exposure is part of everyday life is what really came through. So over 90% of our respondents, and there were nearly 17,000, um, 90% said that they'd been experienced or they had experienced trauma um, exposure as a direct result of work. Um, and also we ran for the first time um, a PTSD screen and a complex PTSD screen within the questionnaire um, called the ITQ. Um, and it was just 10 to 15 questions um, about your experiences and your um, emotional and physical responses to that. And from that, we um, established the first prevalence rate for complex PTSD and PTSD in police in the UK, um, and the first prevalence rate for complex PTSD in any profession in the world. So um, it was quite a Turns out to be quite a landmark study. Um, we also looked at working conditions and how we're currently looking at how the um, quality of your job can actually affect um, how trauma impacts you. And we're looking at the relationship now between working conditions and PTSD. Um, so that's our kind of focus for this year. But there's um, it's a very rich data source. There's a lot of voices in there. Um, there's a lot of um, really personal information about people's traumatic experiences and we're hoping working um, with the police federation research team to develop um, a checklist where we can actually encourage officers to identify the worst types of incidents they've been to so we can start to look at cumulative trauma exposure over a, over a career and also within one role how much officers are being exposed to the worst types of trauma um, so it was a it was a fantastic um and very ambitious uh, adventure of a study um, and there's still a lot more to find out from that data but we're um, we're we're making good progress and uh, I suppose it's really relevant um, uh, to to have a, a baseline mm -hmm. effectively for exposure to trauma uh, within policing and then I think what was key to that study was um, the prevalence rates uh, for yeah. PTSD yeah. and complex PTSD Mm -hmm. Yeah, so overall, um, we established that one in five officers had some form of PTSD, um, which was shocking in itself. What was more shocking was that complex PTSD was more common. So we had 12% of officers and staff had complex PTSD compared to eight having regular PTSD. 
and that difference is important because complex PTSD is where well I like to describe it as where PTSD gets a bit darker so it's where over a longer period of time PTSD kind of changes who you think you are and how you relate to other people and your sense of worth um, which is really important in policing um, to really feel that you're that you're doing a worthwhile job and that, that you're okay doing it and that you're um, that you're intact and in complex PTSD it really shows that that's not the case because the trauma hasn't been processed and it started to erode your sense of why you're doing the job that you're doing as well as who you are so it's definitely something that we need to address um, and if we hadn't done that study we wouldn't have realized that subtle nuance that actually it's the longer serving and the longer exposed officers that are really developing these complex changes in who they think they are um, and that's obviously going to have a knock-on effect to their families and children and so on and so forth so um, it's it's been very very useful to establish that prevalence rate but now we have to act and do something about it and um, try and come together and find some solutions and some preventative um, work to, to help us do something about it. Super. Well thank you for that um, a bit of background um, sure. Obviously, sure. Um, uh, knowing that um, policing uh, is a firstly a pressure cooker environment, um, we know that um, uh, officers in their day to day job are exposed to all sorts of trauma, uh, you know, whether that be victims of domestic violence, um, you know, sudden deaths, uh, road traffic collisions etc that you know the list is endless and then we talk about the accumulative effect as well um that's just standard policing but we are now um, in um, absolutely unprecedented times you know in in my policing career in my life i've never seen anything like what we're experiencing currently in relation to um you know covid19 uh, the lockdown um any standard um you know operating practice is now null and void because we've never prepared for um a, a situation like this and i think what's worrying to a, to a lot of um, officers is that you know you where you normally see um or have exposure to traumatic incidents as part of your job you're now going to be going to significantly more sudden deaths or or or, or um people who've lost their lives to uh, to the coronavirus. So, um, you know, do you have any advice for, for officers who are repeatedly uh, going to this? Because, we, you know, we watch the news every night, we see the death toll. Uh, it's shocking, it's scary. Uh, you know, there, there's anxiety, there's worries about uh, you and your family. Um, so just for the officer on the street who, who's going to an increased number of um, incidents where, you know, a loved one has passed away because of this virus, um, you know, do you have any advice for them? Sure. I mean, I think attending sudden deaths um, has always um, come through quite strongly in our research. Um, it's often reported as being um, officers' worst experiences is, is their first sudden death. So we know that already um, that it's an issue as an incident. Um, in terms of cumulative exposure, we also know that um, over 60% of officers have said that they don't really have time to process one incident, such as a sudden death, um, before going to the next. So we also have to bear in mind that um, the brain needs a certain amount of time to um, file and acknowledge something that's happened before it prepares itself for the next. And I think that's really where we need to um, try and offer a little bit um, of support. And we're not talking about suddenly magicking up some time where people can have a nice decompression, a nice debrief and a trim and um, and sit down, have a cup of coffee and bond. The reality is, is they're probably not going to have time to do that. So what we're looking at now is really trying to keep the communication up and offer some practical techniques um, that officers can take on themselves. And it could be as simple as just taking a few breaths, like when an instant that they've been to is over, that they, they have some sort of safety cue that um, it's finished and it's and it's time to kind of reset and move on to the next one that people just take a moment feel their feet on the ground take a few long exhales to breathe out regulate that stress response back down to normal again and just try and it sounds very bizarre but a very very useful technique that we use in neuropsychology is to engage in abstract thought to stop your stress response so if you can think of that incident that you've just been to and in your mind, describe it with 
a colour or a texture or a sound or a, um, a funny saying or an image um, and give it some sort of unusual label, it helps the brain to identify it as something um, in itself and stops you building up and up and up and up, one on top of the other, each of these sudden deaths and each of these incidents, so that it becomes one big, unmanageable, indistinguishable force of anxiety. If we break each one down and make sure that we take a moment, file it in a way that's unusual, describe it as it is, understand that it's past, and just take a few moments to do that, that might just help prevent that cumulative load. Um, obviously, it's we really need to, to keep an eye on, on how much we're being exposed to. And I would always recommend if you do think that um, what you're being called out to is unreasonable and just not processable for one person in one day that you put your hand up and say so, um, because it's only going to come back on the team later um, if people aren't being looked after. So um, it makes practical sense just to flag up and say, actually, I've been to however many in so many days, um, just to give supervisors and managers a chance to intervene or help if, if they can. So I suppose there's, there's definitely a role for, for supervisors and managers in this as well to, to monitor um, the well-being of their staff, but also to try and establish how many of these types of incidents, incidents uh, they've attended. Yeah. It is. I mean, I don't know how practically um, that's going to be operationally, but there is just a common sense moral responsibility that when you know that you're sending to someone to a similar type of job, hour after hour after hour, day after day, um, when we don't have an end point of when this is going to come to a close, um, that you that you reach out, and it doesn't have to be, we're not talking like touchy-feely, um, massive emotional outpouring, just a recognition of a job well done and ready for the next one, a recognition that this is moving at a pace, a recognition that this is really extraordinary circumstances and, you know, collectively we are having, we are experiencing something unprecedented um, that is going to go down in history. Allow yourself to, and your team to go, gosh, this is just not what we expected. Um, this is extraordinary because when we try and deny that in our brain and pretend everything's normal, stiff up a lip, keep going, that's when the problems really occur. Um, this is a pandemic and people are dying. More people will die. This is extraordinary and we need to allow our brains just to acknowledge that. Just acknowledge that and you can go quite far in kind of adjusting. It's when we try and pretend that things are other than they are, that that's where the problems come up. I suppose this leads me on to um, the, the other question that I have for you is um, if you do acknowledge this and you accept it to a certain degree, it can play on your other emotions like anxiety. Um, you know, I know a lot of officers um, have concerns about uh, going to work and then it potentially bringing home uh, the virus to their family, to their husbands, wives, uh, children, partners, um, and also about just attendance uh, uh, to incidents where they could contract the virus. I mean, uh, I'm uh, I'm in that probably uh, higher risk category. I'm I'm 47. Uh, I used to smoke. Um, and uh, we know that this uh, uh, virus disproportionately affects men more than it does um, uh, women. Um, and uh, uh, people uh, over the age of, um, of 55 or, or 60 are struggling more with it. But everything we watch, everything we attend is, is on the news. That's got to play on your emotions. How can you, are there any techniques that, like you've just recommended that we can use to deal with the anxious side of it? You know, the, that anxiety about the unknown or, 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 or what might happen. I think fundamentally to accept that the anxiety that, that there is here is shared. I think there's a there's a tendency, especially in policing and in emergency response and, and the helping professions is that um, the anxiety is there and we've got to do something about it and we have to control it and manage it and get rid of it because our duty is to protect and our duty is to, to help others. Um, and we can take a lot of responsibility. You know, we've got you know discretionary power to do what we feel is necessary in any given instant. That's a big weight of responsibility for a pandemic. At the end of the day, the anxiety that we have 
is something that everybody is experiencing. It's there for a reason. It's the body and the brain's way of telling us we are under threat and we need to act. But the point is, is that we're acting collectively and that this anxiety isn't your own. Try not to over identify with it. And I'm just as guilty of doing it. I can put my hand up and say that I have struggled. I've really struggled with this unexpectedly. And I think what's happened is, is I have taken on as a mission for myself and I've over identified with it. And um, one just very simple way when, when we're feeling the anxiety building is just to acknowledge there is anxiety here. It's not I am anxious. This is my anxiety. I'm an anxious person. I'm not in control of it. This is out of control. It's just there is anxiety here and it's shared. And at the moment, I'm feeling it. And I think it's really important to just to allow yourself to be anxious. You should be anxious. This is the, the nature of the situation, but just not to over identify with it. Secondly, to see it as a collective that others are in the same position. They might not show it or they might show it in different ways. Um, they might be more withdrawn, they might be more aggressive, they might um, uh, develop coping mechanisms that you didn't expect, but likely the situation is that they're feeling anxiety and they're doing their best to manage it. So do you see it as a, as a collective um, experience, a common experience at the moment. Thirdly, acknowledge that this is going to pass at some point. Um, I read something a few months ago that just made me laugh. It may pass. It may pass like a kidney stone, but it'll pass. So it might be as painful and, and as anxiety provoking and life changing. But these circumstances won't always be the same. Things will change. Um, so just acknowledge that the anxiety you're going to move through. You have to. You won't stay in this position. Um, when it comes to um, you mentioned about people, officers being um, worried about uh, going out um, into the world and bringing the, the virus back home. Um, that's a really common um, anxiety at the moment um, I'm hearing quite a lot about and that's completely reasonable. I think um, one officer mentioned this to me the other day and I thought it was really, really smart observation is that particularly in operational policing, your home is your safe space and officers often live separate to where they work because they want to keep that nice safe boundary uncontaminated by work. Now, when officers are being or having to not being forced but having to go out into this dangerous world where this virus is is lurking they're also coming home and bringing it back in and all of a sudden the boundary between safe place at home and work has become polluted and 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 has eroded um and you're you have people who you care about who are vulnerable your family your loved ones and people you want to be well being affected by it so it's natural that you're going to feel anxious about doing that First, so first of all, again, accept it's natural and it's right that you'd feel anxious. But then also just to take a moment to think, well, what I'm actually doing for my job, I am protecting people. I am doing my best in the circumstances to to address this. I am part of the solution. I'm part of the resolve. And when I come home, it's because I'm coming home from a good day's work. So emotionally set set yourself that task of acknowledging what you've done. And then secondly, maybe even just get some routines, bring a bit of humour into the, the routine and ritual of, of cleaning yourself before you come into the house. If you've got young children, involve them in the process if you can. Um, ask people to, to, to share what they do. Um, bring some humour into it. Maybe, it, you know, not a game, but make it lighthearted if you can. And ritualistic. Brains like routine. Um, and in times of instability, little mini rituals can go a long way, even if they're a bit futile. Wiping down things for no reason or overusing hand gel is fine. If it tells your brain that you're safe and collectively you can be like uh, a family or unit or, or a household or with housemates where you're actually you're doing something together to address this situation. Um, that can really, really help with with anxiety. Superb. Um, I'm not going to take up any more um, of your time, but what I would like to do is obviously um, continue discussions uh, on perhaps another interview and uh, we can take questions in from officers uh, perhaps that we can cover um, the next time we chat but you know what was really key at the moment was was capturing uh, those initial questions because that's what um, that's what members are feeling on the ground so again um, Jess thank you so much for your time uh, any last words from yourself just just to say a big thank you um, for everything that everyone's doing um, this is 
a very, very strange time. Um, and there are some incredible people who are doing incredible work very quietly um, and managing some, some really difficult emotions um, and physical challenges. And just to extend my heartfelt thanks um, to everybody who's going out there and looking after us. Thank you very much, Jess. And hopefully uh, we um, speak to you soon. Wonderful. Bye-bye.